Hello and welcome to the fifth of six presentations in the Global Motivations Lecture Series. My name is Matthew Hughes and I serve as the Executive Director of the International Relations Council in Kansas City. And we're so glad to have you with us today. The International Relations Council strengthens Kansas City's global perspective by maintaining an active dialogue around world events, global issues, and their impact on our community. As a nonpartisan educational nonprofit organization, the IRC values informed civil discourse, accessibility, and substance as we work to sharpen our community's 21st century global acumen. Whether you're joining us live or viewing the recording later, we invite you to learn more about the International Relations Council, including other upcoming events and how to join the IRC as a member on our website at irckc.org. The global rebalance of power continues. The ambitions, alliances, and actions of world powers have accelerated shifts in the international order that was framed in the waning days of the Second World War. What interests countries on the world stage today? What outcomes do they seek? And what role do cooperation and competition play? In the six-part virtual series, we're painting a portrait of six world powers, their internal and external drivers, their evolving role in the community of nations, and what this means for the rest of the world. We hope you'll engage with us today as we explore the motivations of Japan. We certainly welcome your thoughtful questions through the course of the conversation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And do check out and share other IRC conversations as we consider a range of critical issues in the coming weeks. We're grateful to our sponsors who have made today's program and the Global Motivations Lecture Series possible. In particular, thanks to sustaining series sponsors Cyprian Simkowitz and Jerry White and the University of St. Mary and supporting series sponsor Burns and McDonald. Thank you for finding value in these conversations. I'm now pleased to introduce our speaker for today's program, who will help us to dive into Japan's global motivations. Michael Green is Senior Advisor and Kissinger Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Prior to June of this year, he served as Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair and Director of Asian Studies at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University until his appointment as CEO at the U.S. Studies Center at the University of Sydney, where he joins us today. He served on the staff of the National Security Council from 2001 to 05, first as Director for Asian Affairs, and then as Special Assistant to, to the President for National Security Affairs and Senior Director for Asia. And his career has many other highlights focused around Asia. He received his master's and doctoral degrees from Johns Hopkins Sice and did additional graduate and postgraduate research at Tokyo University and MIT. Dr. Green, thank you so much for being with us today. Please take it away. Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, and it's nice to be joining you virtually from Sydney, Australia, where it's a, a beautiful 70 degrees outside. We're heading towards summer here. Um, I moved here a few months ago with my family to look at the world uh, upside down, if you will. Um, I spent uh, 15 years in Washington at think tanks and before that in government. And um, the family thought it'd be, it'd be interesting to spend a few years down under and uh, look at how Asia um, uh, appears um, from one of our closest friends and allies in the region. It's been really quite eye-opening. Um, I began my career as a Japan expert, um, lived in Japan for five years after college, went to Tokyo University and worked in the Japanese parliament, the diet, and, um, and learned there because I worked in local politics that in diplomacy, all politics is local. Um, and um, particularly for democracy, engagement with the world really begins uh, at the sub-national level. Um, it's actually interesting, the State Department has appointed Nina Hachigian, who's a friend of mine, who was the deputy mayor of LA, as the um, ambassador for sub, what they're calling sub-national diplomacy, basically to, to connect uh, Kansas City, LA, Chicago, with Sydney, with Shanghai, with Brussels, and, and, and really um, understand and leverage this uh, whole dimension of American engagement with the world that those of us who grew up in Washington, and I literally was born and grew up in the Beltway, that we often miss. So really pleased to be, to be talking to you and really appreciate what IRC um, uh, tries to achieve uh, with these lectures. So Japan, you know, when I was um, in grad school and uh, studying Japan seriously for the first time in the late 1980s, um, it was the Cold War, um, the Japanese economic miracle seemed unstoppable. Um, Japanese um, yen uh, value had appreciated to the point where um, 
Pebble Beach in California, Rockefeller Plaza in New York being bought by Japanese companies like Mitsui and Mitsubishi. And in public opinion polls in 1988, um, more Americans said they were afraid of Japan than the Soviet Union. 1988 had you know, ICBMs aimed at our major cities with nuclear weapons. Um, today, in 2022, uh, Japan is one of the most trusted allies and partners of the US in the world. Um, in most polls, um, uh, coming in only behind Canada and Britain and, and Australia when it's asked in the question, the so-called cousins or five eyes who we've been side by side with in uh, struggles and conflicts and peace for over 100 years. And it's a remarkable transformation. Um, I remember when I worked in the White House uh, for President George W. Bush, um, he became very close friends with Prime Minister Koizumi of Japan, who you may recall for his sort of lion mane of hair and his, his love of Elvis Presley. And President Bush was intrigued and often said on the campaign stump that his father, George Herbert Walker Bush, fought you know, mortal combat in the Pacific against the Japanese. And yet one of his best and closest friends on the world stage was the Japanese prime minister. And he took great um, uh, comfort from that, frankly, after 9-11. Uh, and it made him something of an idealist, frankly, thinking that our enemies can be our friends and, and, and America can do that in the world. And Japan is one of the greatest success stories uh, after the war in American foreign policy history. Um, there were a lot of mistakes before the war, Japan's as well as ours, that led to conflict. But after the war, the way Japan emerged, the way it became a pillar of the international system is really a tribute to the Japanese people's incredible work ethic and frankly, remorse and reflection on the war uh, and, and, and American strategic culture, you know, motivated a little bit by our vanity, to be honest, but an American strategic culture that believes that we can make even our enemies our friends. And it's worth remembering as we enter a period of very uh, severe strategic competition, uh, tension, conflict perhaps with China. Um, Japan will be and has emerged as the most important country in the world as the US figures out how to deal with a, a rising China, some would say a re-rising China that's impacting everything from um, infrastructure financing and climate change uh, to peace and stability in the Western Pacific, um, in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea, in the South Pacific, and even the Indian Ocean. Japan has emerged as the most important pillar for the US and much of the world in, in terms of how we deal with it. How did this happen? You know, in 1988, as I said, um, more Americans were afraid of Japan than the Soviet Union. In 2012, only 10 years ago, when the Chicago Council on Global Affairs asked Americans um, who will be our most important partner in Asia, um, Japan won, but just barely. And China was rapidly rising in that polling question from, 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 uh, from you know, the very bottom to a trajectory to surpass Japan. In 2013, Chinese uh, leader Xi Jinping proposed to the Obama administration that the United States and China form a new model of great power relations, Xinjin Dagobanshi, the, the great Chinese six character phrases they use in foreign policy. A new model, meaning let's avoid the, the, the historic conflict of rising powers and great powers, Athens and Sparta, Germany and Britain, Japan and the United States. Let's avoid that. Good thought. New model of great power relations. Therein well, lay the problem. Beijing was saying to the Obama administration, if you want to avoid conflict with China, you need to recognize that China and the United States are the two great powers. And Russia is a great power, and perhaps Europe. But Japan, India, Australia, Korea, um, America's close friends and allies, they are second tier powers. They are not great powers. They're not uh, Dagwo, Taikoku, they're not great powers. And within the Obama administration, uh, at the same time, Americans were increasingly arguing um, China was our most important partner. The, 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 the debate was intense. John Kerry, the Secretary of State, Susan Rice, the National Security Advisor, Sometimes Joe Biden, the vice president, favored this idea of a grand bargain with China. Others, Hillary Clinton, when she was secretary, um, Ash Carter, the secretary of defense, who sadly recently passed away, uh, argued no. Um, 
our edge, our advantage in Asia is our allies, our partners, uh, like Japan. We're not going to make an, an agreement with China to sell out our allies and partners just to avoid conflict with China. That would be foolish. Um, they pointed out that in 1950, at the end of World War II, the US had over half of global economic output. By 1970, we had 25%. Today, I think it's about 22%. The reason the United States, despite our many mistakes, the reason we have maintained leadership in the Indo-Pacific and in Europe is our alliances. Our alliances have upheld the system that Americans needed after the war. Japan's been critical of that. But you know, in 2012-13, Japan's demographic picture was bad. Uh, it looked like it was in political turmoil, looked like it was in decline. And the idea that we need to cut a bargain with China and frankly, stop defending Japan's interests, Taiwan's interests, Korea's interests, had some attraction in, in, in Washington and even the American public. It did not happen. It did not happen. In 2019, when the Chicago Council asked the American public the same question, who's our best partner in Asia? Over two thirds of Americans said Japan. In surveys I've done at CSIS and then again here in Australia, um, support for the alliance with Japan is the highest it's ever been. And interestingly, the number of Americans who say the, our alliance with Japan makes not just Japan safer, it makes us safer, has jumped the last few years because of Ukraine, because of China's pressure on Taiwan, um, from about 45% uh, to 55, 60% of Americans who now say, this alliance with Japan isn't just to defend Japan, it makes us safer. And I think that's right. And why did that happen? Why this rapid turnaround? Well, Ukraine, um, Chinese pressure on Taiwan, Xi Jinping's, frankly, very aggressive uh, posture in Asia and the world, and Abe Shinzo, his family name Abe, uh, who was tragically killed uh, by an assassin. Um, Abe built a strategy for Japan in this period. He served as prime minister of almost eight years, the longest in history, and he built a strategy to compete with China. And the strategy was based on strengthening the US-Japan alliance, um, not keeping distance from the US as Europeans often did when Pre President Trump was in power, uh, not keeping distance as Japan did in the Cold War by, by um, saying that the peace clause in Japan's constitution, Article 9, which Americans wrote, um, that that meant Japan could not play a role in a major military crisis. Um, Abe changed that. He changed how the constitution was interpreted to say we need the Americans locked in with us to deal with North Korea and China. Um, and so we have to commit to the Americans and not just the Americans, the Australians and the Indians. And so Abe proposed building out what's now called the Quad, the US, Japan, Australia, India quadrilateral summit, which President Biden has embraced, which President Trump embraced, was Abe's idea um, to get these maritime democracies together to counterbalance China's um, hegemonic ambitions and coercive pressure against neighboring states. Um, and it was remarkably successful. In, um, in the aftermath of Abe's assassination, there was a, an outpouring of, um, of um, acknowledgement, support, uh, emotional from leaders like Narendra Modi of India, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott of Australia, President Biden. But the most striking uh, 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 statement on Abe's death was from Beijing was from the Chinese leadership. And they said, Prime Minister Abe contributed to better Japan-China relations. That's remarkable because when Abe came to power in 2012 for the second time, he was seen in, in China and, and by people in the US as well, some as, as a sort of hawkish revisionist. And the Chinese went at him. The Chinese ambassadors around the world were instructed to write editorials saying that Abe was a dangerous militarist and revisionist and had to be stopped. And, the most you know, ludicrous of those was in London where the Chinese ambassador published a piece in the Telegraph uh, saying that Abe was Lord Baltimore from Harry Potter and that the British and Chinese people must stop him. The Chinese went in, in 10 years from that massive campaign against Abe to acknowledging in 2022 when he was killed that he actually contributed to better Japan. I'll say about Abe and Japan's strategy. The US is now public opinion, bipartisan agreement in Congress, the new national security strategy from the White House. The US is positioning itself for a long competition with China. 
but we don't know how it ends. President Biden can't tell you how this ends. Secretary of State um, uh, uh, Blinken cannot tell you how this ends. The national security strategy does not say how this ends. It says we're going to compete with China. We're going to try to avoid conflict. We're going to stand up for our principles, for our allies, which is which is which is exactly right. Which is not where much of Washington was in 2012. But how does it end? Does the Chinese Communist Party collapse? Is there war? Abe set out when he came to power with the support of the Japanese people broadly to reboot, to reset Chinese expectations, to make it clear that Japan had agency, Japan had allies, Japan had willpower. Japan was not going to roll over and, and acknowledge Chinese hegemony in Asia. It was going to strengthen the alliance with the US and ties with Australia and, and India and others to do that. But the purpose was to coexist with China, um, to blunt Chinese challenges and threats, but to continue economic relations and not contain China. That, that's also the view here in Australia and in Korea. Uh, it's the view in India. Uh, the Biden administration has embraced allies. Um, and in Canberra and in Tokyo and Seoul, governments are grateful. But as I've written in the new issue of foreign affairs, the administration is going to have to listen to allies more. We need allies more. The American people know that. Um, and so we're going to have to listen to allies. And the allies are going to want to find a way to coexist with China, even as we push back and blunt an increasingly um, ambitious and, and often menacing um, Chinese posture from Xi Jinping. So Japan is the most influential country in the world in how we do that, and was a thought leader and is positioned in Asia as the most important pillar of that strategy. So when you talk about global motivations, um, Japan's gotten some short shrift because of its demographic challenges, but given the biggest geopolitical challenge we face, which is China, and the uh, most immediate one is Russia, but long-term it's China, uh, when we're looking for solutions, Japan's the answer. So I'll end with that. I look forward to your, to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Green, thank you so much. Uh, gosh, so many different places that we could dive in. And certainly we'll invite the audience to share their questions in the Q&A feature uh, as we go through the program today. But I wonder if we could start maybe with, with how Japan views itself, right? And I don't know if that's as a government or if that's as the Japanese people. Um, I think many of us know the stories of historic Japanese isolationism, right? Uh, Japan was a very isolated country. It was a country that didn't have a whole lot of interaction with the rest of the world. Um, that obviously changed in the 19th century and and you know and, and obviously the the second world war uh, had implications with that as well how does japan see its role on the world stage today does it see itself in the same way that maybe the us or some of its allies see japan you know the, the question immediately brings to mind um a german friend of mine when i studied at tokyo university one of my best friends was an exchange student from germany and his great grandfather had worked for, worked for krupp which we generally now think of as a coffee machine maker, but they made artillery and things, and machine guns. And he was Krupp's representative in Japan until 1914. And in 1914, he had to go back to Germany because Japan was allied with Britain um, uh, from the Anglo-Japanese alliance. So it was a, an enemy of Germany. And my, my German friend had his diary, it was fascinating. And then the last page he wrote, he wrote remember, it was in German, but he wrote, remember, the Japanese are a nation of pirates and thieves. <laughs> That's right, my wife is going on. Um, and so um, there's something to that. The Japanese uh, are an island people um, separated from the continent. You know, if you ask French or German intellectuals about the British in the 17th century, they would have said England is a country of pirates and thieves quite accurately. And of course, that's the roots of our own political culture and strategic culture in the US, and a maritime nation of pirates and thieves. And, and, um, and so the Japanese have that in common with the US and Britain and Australia. Um, but the Japanese, unlike the British, um, were separated by a much rougher body of water. You know, people swim across the English Channel. I never do it, but people do it. You simply cannot swim across the East China Sea. There are typhoons, the weather's bad, and it's, it's a long trip. So Japan enjoyed a truly um, convenient isolation, which allowed the Japanese um, leaders to um, bring in the culture, bring in the technology they wanted, but keep out the bad influences. And Japan was invaded twice, really, in history, uh, by the Mongols, and that fleet was destroyed by the divine wind, the kamikaze, and by the US Marines and Army in Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And that 
um, stopped before the main islands because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and many of the war. So there is this isolation that you describe in the Japanese um, uh, political culture because of geography. But it also is, a, is, 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 is one characterized by a fascination with power in the world. The Japanese, even behind the closed state from six, the 1600s till Commodore Perry in the 1850s, opened Japan. The Japanese were studying the world. They were watching what was happening to China. And when they emerged, they were extremely conscious of rank in the system. And it goes back to Confucianism, Chinese, Japanese, Korean culture, very rank conscious. Um, uh, but that's how those countries, those civilizations saw the world order. Who's the greatest power? And, and the Japanese were determined to align with the greatest power, first Britain, then Germany, that was a mistake, and then the United States, but within Asia as much as possible to be the leading power. And that's a problem now because China surpassed Japan's economy in 2010. And that really is what motivates Abe. Abe does not want to be, he said in CSIS in Washington, in 2013, I hosted him and he said, Japan is not now and will never be a tier two power. So that rank consciousness is very, very powerful for the Japanese. Um, and that studying the outside world, bringing in technology, competing is very powerful for Japan. Um, and you know, the Japanese political culture has changed. It's still anti-militarist. Passivism still has a strong hold in Japan, but the new go the government, the current government is pledging to increase defense spending from one point 2% to 2%, huge increase in defense spending um, because of China. So Japan competes um, and um, uh, you know people counter Japan out, but I think they made the mistake of forgetting Japanese history. Um, this time the Japanese are not gonna compete by invading Korea or China. They're gonna compete by aligning with Britain and the United States and Australia and other powers, um, which is what they should have done a hundred years ago. And, and, um, and can, can we dive into that comparison a little bit more? Because sure. I, I think that's fascinating to think about, right? The comparisons between the UK and Japan, right? Historically and, and in modern day. And I think, you know, really one of the things that we're really trying to do in this series is understand how internal dynamics impact a country's self-view on the world stage, right? What its motivations are, how it's operating regionally and globally. And you know, one of the other comparisons right now that's that's very, very timely with the passing of Queen Elizabeth is what it means to be a constitutional monarchy in 2022. Uh, we are witnessing a very messy transition of power right now in the UK, right? In the Conservative Party, uh, the shortest termed uh, prime minister in, in modern U UK history, right? And, and Japan has its own strange nuances, right? With what it means to be a constitutional monarchy that was sort of planted after World War II uh, what, what does it mean to have uh, the political structure that they have? So could you comment, Dr. Green, just briefly on um, sort of the, the inner machinations or workings of uh, Japan's politics and, and how that plays out in terms of how the rest of the world sees Japan? So um, I love polls. Um, uh, I actually once read um, all the Gallup polls on foreign affairs ever on a long weekend. My wife, my wife that was when my wife decided she had truly married a nerd. But um, in, in, in 1943, 82% of Americans said, when the war is over, we should hang Emperor Hirohito. And against that understandable outrage after Pearl Harbor and the Bataan Death March and, um, and, and Japan's uh, uh, invasion uh, and, and brutal occupation in China and Manchuria and Korea, in, 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 in the face of that, a handful of scholars and diplomats, Joseph Gru, the former ambassador in Japan, um, uh, uh, Japan scholars who had been grown up as missionaries in Japan, who were working for the US Army, helping them decide how to defeat Japan, were also planning for post-war strategy. And they collectively, everyone in New Japan said, if you get rid of the imperial system, this entire culture and society will collapse into chaos. And then, of course, um, after the war, because of worries about communism and the Cold War, um, it was um, pretty clear the Americans were going to keep the imperial system, but 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 remove um, the um, the political powers of the emperor. So the, the emperor has even fewer authorities than the queen, um, and 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 uh, you know to to much more symbolic as a head of state. Um, 
the prime minister in Britain meets regularly with the queen, as you know, if you've watched the, the series The Crown. That doesn't happen in Japan. The, 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 the imperial line stays quite remote, very remote from politics compared to Britain. And that's how the Japanese want it. Um, when the emperor, when Emperor Hirohito died in 1989, I was a student at Tokyo University and no one ever talked about the emperor in Japan. But when he died, everybody talked about it. And students who were born you know, long after his, uh, his rule uh, were emotional and said, this, 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 this characterizes our nation's recovery from, from the darkest moment in our history. You know, he, that sense of continuity. Uh, older Japanese I knew, one of my best friends, um, uh, our dads, who had been a soldier in China, who had never talked about the war, got out of bottle of sake and started telling us about what he had done in China because the emperor was dead and he could now confess what, 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 what evil you know, he had personally seen. It was remarkable. So I, I realized in that moment, you know, America doesn't do kings, <laughs> um, but there is something powerful in the continuity of a country to have that. Um, and this is something of a similarity, but it, it doesn't really affect politics. The other interesting comparison between Britain and Japan or America and Japan is Japan never had a Brexit moment. Japan never had a 2016 you know, uh, election, the, the MAGA movement and Donald Trump. They never, and part of that is because the Japanese are pretty conservative people. Part of it is because the Japanese economy was slammed by Chinese competition and globalization uh, before ours. They, they went through that earlier. Part of it was that the global financial crisis hit us much harder than Japan because our economy, Britain and the US are much more uh, fluid. Um, uh, and, uh, and part of it was Japan had its own version of, of, of Boris Johnson or, or Donald Trump in the government of Yukio Hatoyama, um, the DPJ, who was a disaster and the Japanese threw him out and don't want to go back, back there. <coughs> Therefore, this is one reason why Japan has had such a clear impact on strategic thinking in the US, in Britain, in, in Australia, not polarized. The Japanese politics are not polarized like the US or, or Britain uh, or Korea or Taiwan. So many countries right now, because of, because of because of globalization, because of growing inequalities between rich and poor, because of social media, so many factors people know well. So many democracies and even authoritarian states are so polarized. Japan's not like that. They're old, they're older, um, but, but they're just, there's debate, it's a democracy, but they're just not as polarized. Some Japanese think that's a problem. They need more debate. But um, that's why this strategy I've described that Abe really consolidated has very broad support in Japan and why it's possible for Japan to sort of be the first to start defining how we deal with trade, how we deal with China, um, because there's more of a consensus. Our, 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 our politics are a mess. Uh, Congress agrees on China. The American people agree on our allies. There's not a big debate about what we do, but it's, we're so distracted yeah. you know, by identity politics. Um, you know, some really important debates, abortion, guns, crime, immigration. Um, Japan's sort of, uh, for better or worse, some Japanese would say it's a problem. Japan sort of passed that now and broadly resigned to the reality they've got to compete and they've got to organize to do it. They don't want a war with China and they're trying to figure out, frankly, in smarter ways than we have, how to do that. Yeah, and I, I want to dive into China more in just a minute. I do want to look back about 20 years, and this would have been when you were in the White House, I believe, uh, and, and the six-party talks in North Korea. I, I think this was probably, for many Americans, uh, the first time that they really saw Japan sort of coming to the table and playing that sort of leadership role with alliances that you were talking about. What is Japan's role with North Korea now? You know, we haven't heard a whole lot about North Korea over the last couple of years. Uh, we obviously saw the summits between uh, uh, between the, the North Korean leader and, and Donald Trump. Uh, but but where does that stand with Japan right now? I, I don't imagine that Japan's concern has really diminished and, and, and North Korea yeah. has obviously kept going. Um, are, are the six party talks dead? Where What can we expect going forward, do you think? No. Um... To answer that, let me briefly go back 21, 22 years uh, when I started in the White House. I was there five years on the National Security Council staff. I was there on 9-11. And it's important to start with that to explain North Korea because when 9-11 happened, Prime Minister Koizumi in Japan was absolutely determined that Japan would lead 
um, with the US on the response and would be active. And the reason was about 11, 12 years earlier, 11 years earlier with the Gulf War, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, um, the, the Japanese were completely, they were the second largest economy in the world and they were completely flummoxed. They couldn't send troops. They didn't want to send money. They were frankly, if anyone in the audience is old enough to realize, they were mocked um, for their complete passivity in mm -hmm. global affairs. And Koizumi as a leader wanted Japan to be proud of itself and to be active and to be seen on the world stage leading. So when 9-11 happened and President Bush, and it was pretty shocking in the White House, as you can imagine, uh, we were sure we were a target. And it, and it appears if it hadn't been for the brave people on the flight in Pennsylvania, we might, might have been. It's a very emotional, tough time. Um, when President Bush called world leaders, Tony Blair in Britain, John Howard from Australia, who was in Washington, Prime Minister Othnar of Spain, those three said, this is an attack and we're going to, we're going to invoke our treaties with you, and this is this is a, a war, uh, not just a not just a police action. Most of the other leaders told President Bush, "Ah, you've got to catch these criminals," and they didn't understand this was an attack on our country um, and not just some criminal thing. Amazingly, Koizumi was in that small group. He was the fourth who told Bush, "This is a war by terrorists, and you've got to defeat them, and Japan's going to help you." And he couldn't do. He was constrained because. The constitution limited his ability to send forces, but he found ways to do it for humanitarian missions, for refueling. He really stepped up. Okay, North Korea in um, 2002, uh, the Bush administration sent a delegation, I was on it, to North Korea to tell them that we knew they were secretly developing nuclear weapons with uranium enrichment. We had an agreement with them from the Clinton administration that they wouldn't do plutonium, uh, but plutonium reactors are above ground and you can see them. Uranium doesn't have the same heat signature. You can build them in caves. So we found out they were, they were doing uranium enrichment. So we went to see them, confronted them, very intense. Um, uh, they, they demanded the U.S., you know, they're gangsters. They demanded the U.S. pay them off, give them bribes. We said no. President Bush called us in and said, I'm not going back to a bilateral negotiation. Our greatest leverage is the ability to bomb them, which we're not going to do. Um, and, and we need to get the rest of Asia into this diplomacy. And we need Japan in it and China and Korea, especially. So the Chinese didn't want to do it, um, but they said they'd do it if Japan and Korea were not included. They wanted Asia and all things in Asia to be decided by the US and China. And President Bush was adamant Japan and Korea had to be in it. And Koizumi was adamant Japan had to be in it. So Japan was very active in the six party talks, which was an effort to try to negotiate with the North Koreans to get them to back off. It made some traction, but it ultimately failed because the North Koreans want their nuclear weapons and we're not going to attack them. So it's very hard with sanctions alone to stop them. Um, at that time, the Japanese were very worried about and focused on North Korea. North Korea had kidnapped at least 18, possibly dozens of Japanese, literally in submarines, scooped them off Japanese shores, including schoolgirls, took them back to North Korea and forced them to teach North Korean spies how to pretend they were Japanese so that they could smuggle um, the drugs and uh, uranium and things. Horrible, horrible story. And the Japanese by 2001 uh, to, uh, knew that and were absolutely livid. Can you imagine if Cuba abducted dozens of American kids off the beaches in, in, in Florida and Georgia and South Carolina? And, and, you know, I mean, we'd attack, we'd invade. So Japanese weren't gonna do that, but absolutely livid. And the North Korean nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs, the Japanese believed, and I think they were right, were targeting Japan primarily. In the Korean War, the US stopped the North Korean invasion with air power and naval power from Japan. And then when we flowed in ground forces, it was through Japan. And Kim Il-sung couldn't do a thing about it. Well, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and now Kim Jong-un wanted the ability to hit US bases in Japan, to hit Japanese cities, to stop us from stopping them if they got in a war with South Korea. So I think the Japanese are right to be worried that they would be the main target of North Korean nuclear weapons or missiles. So they were absolutely obsessed with this. Less so today. It's interesting in the Japanese strategic discourse documents, North Korea is always there, but it's now about China. Um, and um, it, it puzzles me to be honest. A part of it is the North Korea problem is so hard. What do you do? 
and we're not going to attack him, and we're not going to pay them off. So what do you do? You build missile defense, you strengthen your deterrence, you try talking. It's very, very tough. The new White House national security strategy, which came out a week ago, uh, is, is probably 15,000 words. It's very, very long, 10,000. It's at least 15,000 words. It has one sentence on North Korea, wow. which is developing ICBMs to hit Kansas City, <laughs> to hit Washington, but you know, and nuclear weapons. One sentence. Why? They don't know what to do about it. So that may be part of it. The Japanese just don't know what to do. Um, uh, part of it may be um, that the, the, in the longer term and in the geopolitical sense, China's a bigger challenge. And they do know what to do about China. They, you know, they're going to build up their military. They're going to build up their alliances. They're going to, I didn't mention this before, but massive investment in Asian infrastructure so that China doesn't have a free, 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 or a Belt and Road Chinese funding. That, and they're going to talk to China and try to cooperate with China. They know what to do. They've been competing with China for 2,000 years. They're, 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 they're stuck on North Korea. I, I mean, and, and they're, they're living in a volatile neighborhood, right? So you had Chinese missiles landed on Japanese territory a few weeks ago. Is this right? In, uh, when, China, in Japanese, the, e, 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 the, the EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone. So not exactly territorial waters, but Japan's economic waters. Right. So yeah, very close to Japan. I, I mean, so but so it's it's fascinating it's to watch sort of what the what the what the chess pieces are doing here. You know, how much yeah. how much does soft power uh, factor into this? Right. Japanese culture is world renowned. Right. Uh, whether yeah. it is you know culinary or uh, or in terms of anime or just there are so many pieces of Japan that have found their way into the world. I mean, is that is that strategic at all for the Japanese? You know the the. The, the Japanese, um, the, the Korean government about 10 years ago, and, and the Koreans and Japanese always compete. Um, just picture the Irish and the English, and, and, you, and that's all you need to know. <laughs> um, and uh, the Korean government, um, which also has excellent soft power, um, you know, BTS, K pop, but in surveys, um, they always lost to Japan uh, around the world for soft power. It, it, Korean pop is more popular than Japanese pop. But food, movies, music, I mean, comprehensively, the Koreans always compete with Japan. And they did these national surveys. Samsung was hired by the government to survey around the world. And Japan beat them every time. It drove them crazy. Um, and it is remarkable how much soft power Japan has. The Japanese government did not create that soft power. The Japanese didn't create manga and anime. Um, sushi and Japanese food predates you know, the current Japanese government. They mostly got out of the way. Um, and then, you know, Japanese embassies and Japanese consulates are very good uh, at hosting film festivals and manga festivals. The, the um, Sakura Matsuri, the, the, the Cherry Blossom Festival in Washington, D.C., um, every April is the biggest cultural festival in Washington, by far. Bigger than um, jazz, uh, barbecue competitions, Hispanic festivals, uh, single and male, bigger than all of them, by far. And the reason is that people come from around the country for you know, cosplay, <laughs> dressed up as anime. Uh, a million people, I think. Um, and the Japanese ambassadors out there who went to Tokyo University and Oxford and Harvard, and he's in his suit, and he's trying to represent Japan, talking awkwardly because people dressed up as like, you know, schoolgirl ninjas. <laughs> and it's really funny. So the Japanese government didn't create soft power. It was just this funky, fun, um, slightly weird uh, Japanese, incredible aesthetic culture that just captured the world. Um, you know, when I went to Japan for the first time, I was completely struck by the fact that in Japanese, the word for meat and the word are the same, kide. And so there's just a beautiful tidiness um, to Japanese aesthetics that just captures the world. Um, and, um, and it's very, very powerful. And um, uh, Chinese soft power doesn't even come close. Um, and the reason is because the Chinese Communist Party is strangling creativity in China. It's not that China doesn't have wonderful uh, art and music and movies, um, but the Chinese Communist Party is insisting on propaganda. And once you do propaganda, it ceases to really be art and you lose the aesthetic appeal. So in survey after survey, China, excuse me, Japan and Korea um, uh, uh, overwhelmingly beat China in soft power. But you know who wins in soft power surveys? The US. Still, <laughs> um, 
when, when Asians are asked about soft power in the US, if you think comprehensively, it's a range of questions they ask. Where would you go to university? Which fast food do you like? What movies do you like? It's, it's comprehensive. I mean, um, Kentucky Fried Chicken eaten as the Christmas meal, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, the US amazingly wins. And when people are asked, who do you think has the greatest soft power in Asia? Um, Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans rate the US number one. Americans rate the US as last place. <laughs> Americans think we have our soft power is, the power is embarrassing and no one likes us. Um, the US has image problems for sure, uh, particularly after January 6th. Um, very bad for our image. But American popular culture and soft power is still, um, you know, our survey showed people in Japan, especially in Australia, are very worried about American democracy and our politics. But American soft power, broadly defined, is, is pretty competitive. And it's because the government doesn't do it. It's in spite so, of the government. So, so let's dive in a little bit more into China, if we could. And, and, you know, China will be the last country that we're focusing on in this series. So we haven't gotten there yet, so to speak. Um, but one of the challenges that we've heard as we've gone through the other programs in this series are the economic entanglements that so many other countries in the world have with China, which really hinders their ability to check China as they might like, right? Um, so we're going to create these strategic alliances, we're going to position military vessels, we're going to do all of these things, right? Um, but it's difficult to have sort of a full bore uh, counter, whatever it might be, uh, just because of the economic entanglements. Is that the case for Japan? What 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 is the economic relationship between China and Japan? And what maybe are the challenges for uh, Japan in terms of being able to check China's influence in the region? So the, the debate about China and the US is um, confounded by our difficulty um, sometimes walking and chewing gum at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I work in the US Trade Representative Office, Pentagon and the White House, and in between those stints in, in universities and think tanks. And we really struggle with this in the US. How can we how can we have a military competition with our major one of our major trading partners? How, how do you do that? And we tend to swing back and forth. And um and 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 now we've sort of settled on a strategy, but we still haven't quite figured it out. As I said, like we still trade with China. In surveys I did at CSIS and here in Australia of Americans and Australians and Japanese, only about 20% say we should cut off economic ties with China. You know, 80% say maybe reduce, but maintain them. If you're a grain, if you're a soybean exporter in the Midwest, you don't want to cut off ties with China. If you're a consumer at, you know, Costco, you don't want to cut off imports from China. However, if you are, a, 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 you know, a, a high-tech manufacturer, you, you're going to be super careful about China because you know they still, that the intellectual property rights is stolen, that there's dumping, that there's predatory economics. It's taken the American government, and I was there, a really long time to figure out how do you do all this at the same time? The Japanese kind of figured it out 15, 20 years ago. They've been living next to China for a long time. That helps. Um, so the Japanese are very dependent on China economically, but but they've, 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 they've come to the position, particularly under Abe, that they're not going to let China use that as a cudgel. And so you know, Abe, over his term, built up Japan's defense budget, built up Japan's lead in the creation of the Quad, you know, alignment with US, Australia, and India, um, changed the constitutional interpretation to allow Japanese forces to do more basically combat with the US and Australia, obviously against China, uh, although they never said that explicitly, did all these things, praised democracy, all these things. Meanwhile, the Japanese economy grew because they welcomed Chinese tourists. They exported, um, you know, high-end expensive strawberries to China. They Toyota sold massive numbers of cars in China. It's a real dichotomy, um, and the, the Japanese are constantly fine-tuning, and and they're, the Japanese companies are moving high-tech out of China uh, uh, for a variety of reasons we can talk about. Um, but they're not cutting off trade. They're trying to find the right balance. They need China to grow economically, but they also, from Japan's own experience, know the consequences of completely cutting off a country economically. In 1929, after the financial crisis, the US Congress introduced the famous smooth Hawley tariffs in 1930. And Herbert Hoover was told by a thousand economists in a letter, don't sign it, and he did. And tariffs went up. And trade with Japan dropped 
in a matter of months in half. And within Japan, exporters, silk farmers, who suddenly were thrown into poverty, became radical militarists, anti-American. And it's not the main reason Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. There was, that was in the DNA of Japan's emergence and compli complication of geopolitics. But the US definitely threw gasoline on the fire with protectionism. And the Japanese government and people know that. If you completely cut off a country, even one that's becoming menacing like China, if you completely cut them off, there's, there's real risk to that in international relations. So the Japanese want to get rich off China, um, but they don't want China stealing their intellectual property. Um, and so they're, they're calibrating. So are the Australians now. Um, and the US is, is rapidly learning to do the same. Um, so it's very, very, uh, very, very, you know, it's like a bad marriage or something. The Japanese can't get out of it, but they don't want, they don't want to, but they're not going to, um, they're, they're going to keep separate bank accounts. They're not going to, they're not going to let the Chinese uh, government have access to their best technology. Do you, do you see Japan taking an increasing leadership role in multinational organizations like the United Nations, uh, in, in global development efforts, in relief efforts? Uh, you know, we, we've all just been through this pandemic for the last two years. I mean, there are opportunities, right, for, for countries to sort of shine on a global stage um, in, in different ways. Is Japan stepping into more of those roles? Yes and no. Um, for um, uh, 30 years or so, Japan has been the second largest contributor after the U.S. to the United Nations system, um, to the International Monetary Fund. I mean, a lot of the post-war institutions that upheld international order um, are supported after the United States by Japan more than any country. Um, and in the era of Abe, Japan has really stepped up at a time when the U.S. has started retreating from some of these multilateral institutions, the World Trade Organization, uh, President Trump unilaterally withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. Biden said he's not going in. Japan has stepped up and, and kept those afloat. And, 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 and from the perspective of this region, even the Chinese will grudgingly acknowledge it, uh, replace the U.S. in keeping these big multilateral trade and economic agreements going in Asia. And, and, and constantly nudging Washington to come back and participate in trade agreements and economic agreements again. Um, and they can't do it without us, but they're leading as we um, sort of retreat, frankly. We, you know, the, the, the US has, one of the key pillars of our success in Asia and Europe was our, our, our readiness to lead on trade agreements. And um, in 2017, Trump pulled out and Biden was afraid to go back in. And the Japanese, Australians, the Canadians, they all know and so does American business. And polls show so does the majority of the American people that we've got to export, we've got to have markets, we've got to be engaged. The Japanese are largely holding a place for us while we figure it out. The Australians, the Canadians, some of our closest friends in the world are, are helping. On the other hand, although Japan is such a large contributor to the UN, very few Japanese go to work for the UN. Japan does have some problems. And one of the problems is demographics, but another problem is Japan is a really, really nice place to live, except for earthquakes. Really nice. Food is good. It's safe. There are more three-star Michelins in Tokyo than in Paris. It's wonderful. It's safe. You can buy beer. You can buy kegs of beer out of vending machines in Japan. It's, it's awesome. And young Japanese don't want to go abroad. It's a big problem. They don't, they, they've lost a little bit of their wanderlust and their adventure. And so the number of Japanese studying in American universities you know, is much lower than it used to be. The number of Japanese working in the UN is much lower. So they do, there is worry in Japan that the younger generation, although they're, 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 they're in favor of the alliance with the US, they think Japan should compete. On a personal level, they're very happy to stay in Japan, to buy beer out of vending machines, to play the coolest video games in the world, to live in a safe city. So in that sense, you need not just money and ideas, you need people to go out and work in these institutions. And Japan does have a problem there. They're well, there. And, and I mean, and, and that's the question, that's the, that's the million dollar question, right? Is, is Japan running out of fuel, so to speak, uh, when you have such an aging population, right? Is, is Japan just going to lose steam at some point? I don't think so, but it is a debate. Um, I don't think Japan's going to lose steam because for 2000 years, Japan never lost steam. Um, when confronted with a major challenge, whether it was, China becoming the dominant civilization in Asia, the arrival of the Western powers, um, defeat after World War II, 
um, Japan has always organized itself to, 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 to be a player, to be active. And you can see it now in, in, uh, in Abe strategy. Um, the demographics are a problem, but um, demographics are not destiny. Japan has some of the best robotics in the world. For example. Um, it, 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 when I was in Japan studying Japan, I was taught the Japanese views of women, Japanese views of immigrants will never change. Well, they have. You know, Abe brought 3 million women into the workforce, pushed for women's rights. Why? Because they didn't have enough people. They needed to get productivity. The Japanese defense forces have um, historically had about seven, I think, percent women. For the US, Britain, Australia, Canada, it's about 16, 17, 18% are, are women in the force. The Japanese made a decision, we're gonna do that. We're gonna double the number of women in the military because we have to, we can't compete otherwise. So these gender norms just changed. My, my dad was very involved with this in the Pentagon in his career, uh, uh, getting women into combat billets. Took him 30 years to get women on submarines, serving on submarines or fighter pilots. The Japanese did it in one year because they need the people and the women are talented. So, you know, these cultural norms, this insularity, it can change. Uh, do women have equal rights in Japan? No, there's a huge amount still to be done. But this external shock of China's rise of, of geopolitical competition, you can see that the Japanese people are organizing to keep up their fighting weight. Um, despite some of the challenges I mentioned, but even that, even young, you know, the younger Japanese not being, not having you know, konjo fighting spirit, after the massive earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster in March 2011, massive, 24,000 people killed, whole parts of northern Honshu wiped out. You know what happened? These same, you know, your keg buying, video game playing you know, kids in their 20s, you know what they did? On Friday night, they go from their company to a bus station and thousands and thousands of them took buses up to Tohoku and dug people out. And then they take a Monday morning bus at 4 a.m. back to Tokyo and go to work. Thousands of them. So it's Japan, you know, I find myself saying this about America here in Australia, it's much more complicated uh, than you, you often see when you just look at the surface. So I don't think Japan will run out of steam, but it's not guaranteed. It's not yeah. guaranteed. It is one of the big questions. With, with the time we have left, Dr. Green, and, and um, I want to thank our audience again for their participation in today's program. I, I want to make sure that we talk about another neighbor of Japan's that we really haven't touched on, uh, and that's Russia. Uh, Russia and Japan obviously have a very complicated history. Uh, what was what was Japan's reaction? I guess we can imagine, but what was Japan's reaction to the Russian invasion of Ukraine? And does Japan have any concerns from that angle uh, for, for the coming years? You know, I thought you were going to say Korea. Because um, South Korea is America's other close ally and friend in Northeast Asia. And the Korean diaspora and Korean Americans are an incredibly important part of our ties to Korea, but also our own politics and, and economy and culture. And yet, um, our two closest friends, Japan and Korea, in Northeast Asia, fight like siblings. I'll save that for another time. It's, it's a little better, but it's a, it's a long-term challenge for both Japan and Korea and a problem for the US. Russia, totally different story. The Japanese people and governments have viewed Russia as an enemy for a long, long time, and um, for good reason. Um, and uh, Abe, when he was prime minister, thought he had an opportunity and even a responsibility to try to um, break through with Russia. Russia and Japan never signed a peace treaty after the war. Russia still occupies islands off of the north uh, of, of Hokkaido. It's, a, it's an open wound in the relationship. Abe thought, because he's a conservative on the right, he could be the one to cut a deal. Like Nixon goes to China, same logic. Uh, he has the nationalist bona fides to cut a deal. He, he thought it would be a good thing to do because he was doing so much with the Americans to deal with China. It wouldn't be a bad idea to show he doesn't do everything the Americans want. He's gonna work with the Russians and see what he can do. And he also thought it was a good idea because Putin was growing closer to Xi Jinping and the worst picture for Japan not the worst, but a very bad scenario would be a, a Russia-China alliance. Um, and he wanted to try to block that. Completely failed. It didn't fail because Abe was not skilled as a diplomat. And it didn't scale, fail because his logic was wrong. Russia, if it were a normal country, would, would, would reconcile with Japan, get investment with Korea, be less dependent on China, 
But Putin wouldn't do that because Putin doesn't care, frankly, about the Russian people or the Russian economy. Putin cares about his megamalot, I can't say it, his frankly insane uh, vision of restoring Russian dominance and pride. And, um, and so it failed. Um, and uh, instantly when, when Ukraine was invaded, the Japanese government dropped its effort with Russia and joined the G7 countries, Britain, France, US, Canada, Germany, and imposed crippling sanctions on Russia at economic cost to Japan, but did it. And you see Ukrainian flags in Japan, which is kind of amazing. And there's, there's a really strong sense and the foreign minister and the prime minister have said this, if the world, the free world doesn't stand up to Russia today, then how can we count on the Europeans or the Canadians um, if we have a problem with China tomorrow? Uh, so it's smart strategy, but what's, it's but it's more than that. It's not just calculated. There's a genuine sympathy and really like with Americans. You know, I I just moved from Bethesda, Maryland. There are Ukrainian flags in the neighborhoods. People who never thought about Ukraine five ten years ago. And for Japan, this insular country, you see a bit of that too. A sense that this is our world and we have a role to play. So again, it's a real complicated dichotomy. But 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 um, Japan has not sent weapons like the US or Canada or Australia or Britain, but it has sent a lot of money and it has imposed a lot of sanctions on Russia. Um, and, you know, Japan matters, not just in Asia, but in, in, in Europe as well. So let, let's finish up then with a question about if, if you were advising the Biden administration today, looking out on the big world and all of the complexities going on and trying to figure out the best way to work with Japan right now, um, you know, there's a, obviously a huge cultural distance between uh, the U.S. and Japan, right? American and Japanese culture and, and ways of doing things. Um, what, what would you advise the Biden administration? How would you say that Japan can most effectively be used in a partnership? You know, I have advised the Biden administration uh, before I came over to Australia quite a bit, in fact. I was in the White House quite a bit, the State Department. I, I hosted dinners for Republican members of Congress and um and Democrats with senior people in the Biden administration, all to talk about uh, Asia, our alliances, Japan, China. And I tell people here in Australia, behind the really you know, visceral and unpleasant partisanship in American politics, uh, which looks really bad from Australia, by the way, behind all that, it is remarkable how much bipartisan consensus there is in Congress, between Congress and the administration, of think tanks in Washington from far left to far right, how much consensus there is, frankly, about what I'm talking about, about the importance of Japan, of our allies uh, to deal with China. Um, and so I'll tell you what I told the Biden administration. They're getting a lot right. Um, unlike 2012, 13, when Biden was vice president, they're not going for this new model of great power relations, this sort of bromance with China. They, they, they've read Xi Jinping's behavior and they're they're they're, they're strong with Japan. The last White House strategy on Asia, the Indo-Pacific strategy in February, mentioned allies like Japan 35 times, 33 times. It only yeah. mentioned China four times. They're all in on allies. That's great. Yeah. Um, the, the two things they're not doing, and the Japanese and Australians and other allies are quietly telling them, we love you, man, but you've got to do this. Uh, three things. One is uh, trade. Um, the U.S. withdrawal from TPP was a gut punch to our friends and allies and our business and our farmers and, and, and ranchers and exporters. And um, we've got to get back into trade. There's the Indo-Pacific economic framework, which is kind of a talk shop dialogue for now. We've got to turn that into something more substantive and really lead on writing the rules uh, for trade and investment and exports in Asia with our friends and allies. Because if we don't, China will increasingly try to do it. That's one. The administration knows it. They're sick of hearing it, um, but it's true. Um, second, I think they need to increase defense spending. The Chinese Navy, when I was in the White House, was smaller than the Seventh Fleet, our, our fleet based in Japan. It's now five times bigger. Um, I think if the Republicans win the House, they're going to increase defense spending. They always do. And I think a lot of um, people in the, in, the, in the Biden administration will quietly be thankful. Um, the third thing I don't know how to fix, which is our democracy looks kind of sick to our friends. Now, the Japanese, when we asked about, are you worried about American democracy, 20% said yes. So we're okay there. When you ask people from the Anglosphere, from their cousins, Australia, Canada, Britain, they're really worried about us. Half of Australians worry about American democracy. So if we're going to ask 
them to stand with us. Uh, we, 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 and I don't know how you fix this. It's a much, much larger question. But, but I tell you, living abroad, um, this hurts us. This hurts us. As much as I tell people, look, behind the scenes, Republicans and Democrats agree on allies. We agree on America's role in the world. Um, you know, despite what you see on national TV, the, you know, the, I tell people um, reruns of, um, of Friends get more viewers than Fox or MSNBC. You know, when you go to state and local government, there's incredible innovation. The Congress may look dysfunctional, but it just passed two of the biggest pieces of legislation in history, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Science Act. Um, and I quote Mark Twain. Uh, you know, Mark Twain said that the music of Richard Wagner is not as bad as it sounds. But as much as I say to audiences in Australia or Japan, it's not as bad as it looks in the US. They don't like what they see. And, and frankly, our surveys show neither do Americans. 50% yeah. of Australians are worried about American democracy. 70% of Americans are. So I don't know how you fix that, but it is a factor that although our allies are very pro-alliance with us, they're worried. They're yeah. worried. Sorry to end on a down note. We, no, we, I mean, but no, but it, I think it's- I think it's starting the, in Kansas City. Yeah, that's right. I, I think it's the point of the series, right? Is to figure out what, what are all the pieces at play in the world right now. And you've given us a lot to think about. Dr. Michael Green, thank you so much uh, for joining us across the ocean. Uh, we're delighted to have you and welcome to Kansas City anytime that you happen to be around. We'd love to have you here. And everyone, thanks to you for joining us for this installment of the Global Motivation Series. Uh, we have one more program left in the series. We'll hope you'll join us for that. And check out irckc.org for more. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Bye. Take care.